Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10 today. This is a very important chapter. It deals with Jesus sending out the twelve on a mission trip. And in so doing, he kind of defines their responsibilities, their attitudes towards service, and the call and qualifications for a disciple. It's so very important we see this because in our day, I think we've kind of made doing Christianity attending church once a week. But we, this chapter desperately needs to be heard in our day and in our personal lives. Let's look at it if we could. Then he called the twelve disciples. Now, that, that means learners. Then in verse 2, they're going to be called apostles. This is the first time uh, in Matthew they're called that. And it's from the verb apostello, to send, with a view to artificial authority. They're going to be Christ representatives. Now, the truth is, all of us are Christ representatives. The word Christian was first used in Antioch of Syria to mean little Christ. And that, of course, is really what we are. We are meant to shine with his light in a fallen world. Now it says, He gave them authority, ex usia, same as John 1, 12, right, legal authority, uh, over foul spirits so they could drive them out and so they could cure all diseases and ailments. Well, here again is that obvious distinction between demon possession and physical disease. Now, demons sometimes cause physical diseases, but there's a noted exception between the supernatural and the natural. Uh, and we need to see that because we're going to make a false distinction in our day, which was real nervous about supernatural things. I certainly believe in the demonic, and I certainly there's physical illness not related to the demonic. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Here are the names of the twelve apostles. Now, these names are listed several times. Mark 3, 13 through 19, Luke 6, 12 through 16, Acts 1, 13 and 14. The list sometimes changes, but this is always the same. Peter is always first. Judas Iscariot is always last. There are four groups of three. Even though the names change in order in the groups, the groups stay the same. It's always Peter, uh, James, and John. You see, those inner circle was that first group. Now, just to show you some of the differences, uh, Bartholomew is the same as Nathaniel, and Thaddeus is the same as James. I mean, uh, yeah, James, Judas, the brother of James, uh, Simon the Zealot is the same as Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot can mean a city in Judah, Curioth, or it can be an assassin's knife, and we're not sure which it is. Now, in verse 5, Jesus gives them the charge. Now, Jesus is going to send out the 12 here, but later on he's going to send out the 70. And there's a distinction made, okay? Uh, here it's the 12. Uh, he sent the twelve out. The word sent is the same root word as the word apostle. It's used again down in verse 16. Now, the parallels in the Gospels to this sending are Mark 6, 7 through 13, Luke 9, 1 through 6, and then an allusion to that in Luke 22, 35 and 36, okay? Now, it's only in Mark 6, 7 that we know he sent them in pairs. Didn't send them alone, sent them in pairs. Do not go to the heathen or any Samaritan town. This seems somewhat unusual. Um, but Jesus apparently came first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were not to go to Gentiles or the half-Jew Samaritans. Now, you remember the history. The northern ten tribes were exiled in 722 B.C. by Assyria, and the people who were left were Jewish, but they intermarried with the resettled uh, Gentile population. They became the Samaritans, who the Jews hated because of their half-Jewishness. Okay? Now, but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel... Uh, they were the ones in need. You might want to see uh, chapter 15, 24. This is discussed. This is possibly where Paul got his idea to the Jew first and also the Greek. Jesus came to minister to the house of Israel to fulfill the promises of the Messiah. Now, he dealt with the, uh, a Roman centurion during his life. He dealt with a Syrophoenician woman. He dealt with Greeks, but not on a regular basis. Now, Gentiles, I mean. As for you, go... Continue to preach. Now, the word go is a present participle, much like the Great Commission, as you are going. Now, the word preach is a present imperative. As you are going, this may mean your regular part of life, but here it's a special mission. Uh, but it involves the idea of this is not just a one-time thing, but a manner of life for God's leadership and God's people. That's the 12 and the 70. 
Now, as you go, preach. This is the ideal of make proclamation. It's not someone in a suit behind the pulpit. It's God's people sharing who they are. The kingdom of heaven is near. Now, the kingdom of heaven in Matthew is the same as the kingdom of God in Mark and Luke. The Mark and Luke, written to Gentiles, doesn't have the problem using God's name that Jews do. So, Matthew loses a circumlocation. It's the idea of the reign of God in men's hearts now that one day be consummated over all the earth. In uh, Matthew 6, 12, where Jesus prays, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's praying for the kingdom of God to come. The kingdom of God is present now in Jesus Christ, yet it's not consummated. It will be one day. Notice where it says here, the kingdom of God is near. Keep on curing the sick, raising the dead, healing lepers, driving out demons. The characteristic of the new age are seen not only in Jesus, the new age, but in his representatives. Now, the idea of... Um, Curing the sick and raising the dead. These are messianic signs. And, of course, lepers were those who were viewed as being struck down by God himself, yet they're going to be set free here. Uh, the demons, of course, are an intensification of this activity in the life of Jesus. There'll be another intensification of this right before his second coming. We live with those realities every day, but there's an intensification at the incarnation and at, before the parousia. Now, you received and gave no pay. You must give and take none. Do not accept gold or silver, even copper money. And look a little lower, for the workman deserves his support. Now, it seems to be contradictory. But what it's saying is, you freely receive the gospel, you freely give it. You don't ask for money. You'll be misunderstood. You'll be just seen as another Greek teacher. Uh, you freely give the gospel because you freely received it. But in the same context, he says, a workman deserves his support. Uh, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians 9 where Paul speaks about this, that it's appropriate for us uh, to pay clergy. This is not a universal principle, don't pay clergy. It is saying that we need to give the gospel freely, and yet workers deserve their support. Here their support would be that people would take care of them and feed them, though they're not to receive money for it. Now, there's going to be a, a lot of controversy in this ideal of, of a purse or a staff or a shoe, because there's some discrepancy here. Now, the purse meant a money belt. They're to take no extra provision, is what it's talking about. God's going to provide on the way. Uh, no bag would be like a suitcase, nor two shirts, nor any shoes, nor a staff. Now, in Mark 6, 8, it says, take a staff with you. It seems like a direct contradiction. There have been two explanations of what this seeming contradiction may really mean. Some say, following John Calvin, the word staff has been interpreted two ways. Uh, Matthew, it, it can be interpreted as a walking stick or as a protecting club. And uh, Matthew's saying, don't take a protecting club. God will protect you. Uh, while Mark is saying, take your walking stick with you. Some have said, no, it's in the idea of the word two shirts. He's saying, don't take two shirts, don't take two pairs of shoes, don't take two walking sticks. W take one, and God will provide your needs. Now, which it is, we're just not sure. But I hope it's not that big a deal to you. <laughs> uh, whatever town or village you go into, inquire of some deserving person. Stay at his home until you leave. Don't uh, go to a person's house, and if you find a better place or a richer man, uh, go, go to the richer one. No. Stay where you are is the idea. God will provide. Um, as you go into a house, wish it well. This is the Jewish blessing of peace. Uh, if it's deserved, it'll stay. If it's not, it'll go back to you. Now, the, the, the if here is a third-class conditional potential action. Okay? Now, the idea about shaking the dust off your feet if the town rejects you, this is a cultural idiom of judgment used quite often in the Gospels. Now, we'll see Acts 13, 51, Acts 18, 6. It was a sign that they had been rejected and God's judgment abided on them. Uh, for I tell you, the punishment on the day of judgment will be lighter for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah and for that town. And this is the idea of degrees of punishment based on how much of the gospel they know, how much light they had. You see, the greater the light we have, the greater the condemnation if we reject it. The less light we have, the less the condemnation if we ignore it. Now, you may want to see for this, these degrees of punishment, uh, Matthew 11, 22 through 24, Matthew 18, 6, and Luke 12, 48. To whom much is given, much is required. The unpardonable sin is the Pharisees rejected Jesus in the presence of great light. Listen, I'm sending you out as sheep surrounded by wolves. See Luke 10:3. Uh, you might want to see Matthew 7, 15 and following for the idea of wolves. Uh, sometimes they come in religious garb, uh, but you can tell they're wolves by their attitude and action toward the people of God and the message of God in Jesus Christ. You must be sensible like serpents and guileless as doves. Now see Romans 16:19, where it says... 
We must be wise but innocent. That's a good idea. We're not to be dumb. We're to be informed, but we're to be innocent or quiet in the way we uh, spread the gospel. There's a, there's a real importance there. We're not to look for conflict, though we are to be bold in our proclamation. Be on guard against men, for they will turn you over to the courts and flog you in synagogues and bring you before governors, kings, for my name's sake, to bear witness to me to the heathen. Now, this first idea of the courts would be local synagogue courts, and they're going to flog you in the synagogues. Now, flogging was a Jewish manner of punishment, going back to Deuteronomy 25.3. They hit you one-third of the 39 lashes on the front and two-thirds of the 39 lashes on the back. It was not as severe as Roman scourging, and Paul, in I think it's 2 Corinthians 11, says he was beaten several times with rods. Notice they're going to do it in the synagogue for religious purposes. They're going to beat you in God's name, thinking they're doing something on God's behalf. But in reality, they're beating God's children. That's where it says governors and kings. This refers to uh, Roman officials or Roman's puppet kings to bear witness to them. This is uh, God's witness before leaders and magistrates uh, and the heathen. You might want to see this implies the Great Commission, that we will speak to Gentiles eventually. Uh, but, what they turn, but when they turn you over to courts, you must not worry uh, at all about what you will speak, because the Holy Spirit will give you in that hour. Now, this word, do not worry, is a middle subjunctive, just like verse 26. And I think it's matched with the present imperatives of verse 20, uh, 28 and 31. What it's saying is, stop worrying. Don't be concerned. Don't be afraid of them. I'm with you. Hang in there. It's going to look bad, but I'm with you. For you see, he sent them out to preach. You would expect they're going in God's name with God's message. They'd be well received. But the tragedy of modern life is that God's message is ignored or vehemently rejected. We are to expect that. It's not going to be a bed of roses. It's going to be a prison. And how suffering is the norm for the believer. That's what we've really missed. We're, su we're surprised when we're not well received. We're surprised when people misunderstand us. We're surprised when people persecute us because of God's namesake. Those in verse 22, they'll hate you for my namesake. Now, you might want to see uh, Matthew 24, 9. You might want to see John 15, 18 through 27. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Romans 8:17, Philippians 1:26, 2 Timothy 3:12, 1 Peter 4:12 through 19. Suffering is the norm for the child of God doing the will of God in a fallen world. Now, uh, verse 19 is not saying that we don't have to prepare for our sermons and teachings. This is in an hour of crisis. This is on a, mo a, a moment's notice. We don't have to fear what we'll say. God's Holy Spirit will witness through us if we'll let Him, and that's very important. Now, it's not about uh, uh, but the Spirit of your Father that is speaking through you. Now, the Holy Spirit is often called the Spirit of Christ. You see that in Romans 8, 9. But he's also called the Spirit of the Father in Romans 8, 11. So there's a fluidity among the work of the Trinity. Some, some places there's a real distinction made in the three persons. Somewhere there's a, sometimes there's a real unity spoken of. Both are true. That's where it says, brother will turn you over to death and father and child. You know, it's going to be family problems. It's going to be, uh, the gospel is going to divide families. You all see verse 34 and following. It seemed that it would unite, but the reality is in Jewish setting, as well as a Gentile, uh, some accept and some reject. And those who do not accept him often persecute those who do. Modern India is a good example of that. Uh, now, notice where it says in verse 22, but whoever bears up to the end will be saved. Now, I want to tell you, I believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe as strongly and as biblically as the, the security of the believer. But I believe either, either side without the other one is unbalanced. Now, we'll see Galatians 6, 9. Do not weary, go weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. The letters to the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, where they say, He who holds out to the end will have the crown of life. Now, let me just re remind you again that we must remember uh, that perseverance is an evidence for a valid reception of the gospel. The whole book of 1 John says uh, evidence for a true profession is lifestyle Christianity. Both initial response and ongoing discipleship are the norm of the Christian life. One without the other, a warning light ought to begin to blink. You want to see Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 for a beautiful balance of that. Now, there is an exception, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, uh, but the norm is those who know him will live for him. Now, verse 23, but who, whenever they persecute you in one town, flee to a different one. We're not to cause trouble. We're meant to be bold, but we're not to uh, look for problems. And we, ought, we ought to remember that. So sometimes as Christians, we're a little pushy. We're not meant to be that way. For I solemnly say to you, you will not cover all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man returns. 
Now this, this seems like that Jesus is going to break into the mission trip. The context is the mission trip, but he didn't break into it. So there's been a lot of controversy over what this means. Some say it refers to the transfiguration. Some say it refers uh, to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Some think it refers to the second coming. It's obvious to me that this is related somehow to the mission trip, but Jesus said it in such a way that we're not exactly sure what he means. If I have to pick one, I think it's the post-resurrection experiences where Jesus fulfilled every promise he made uh, to these men. Now, the Son of Man is Jesus' self-chosen title. It, it goes back, I think, not to Ezekiel or the Psalms where it means human being in Aramaic, but I think it goes back uh, to the idea of Daniel 7.13 where it's used of both humanity, but in riding on the clouds of heaven is the transportation of deity. So here we have the twin focus of the person of Christ, fully God and fully man. And I think that's why Jesus used it. It wasn't used by the rabbis. It had no uh, polluted connotations. I think he chose it for himself. No pupil is better than his teacher and no slave is better than his master. The pupil should be satisfied to become like his teacher. Now we'll see 1 Peter 2.21. And the slave should be satisfied to become like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much worse names will they heap on the members of the family? Well, first I want to say the fact that we're members of the family is a hallelujah verse. You, 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 and me, we are members of God's family. Isn't that unbelievable? But the other side of that is because we are, they're going to castigate us and impute our motives and attack us. Even religious people are going to do that when they don't know, really know him. Now, the idea of Beelzebub here, this is, this is uh, spelled two ways. You might want to see uh, Matthew 12, 24 and following for the same idea where they said that Jesus is empowered by Beelzebub, which is an inner biblical name for the chief of the demons. Now, there's two different spellings here. Beelzebub is the, god, the fertility god of Ekron. You might want to see 1 Kings chapter 1. But the Jews like to slightly change these names to make them sound funny. So they change it to Beelzebul, I mean it's Beelzebul, B-U-L, which means Lord of the Dung or Lord of the Flies. And the Jews did this to many names. And so it's probably originally Beelzebub, going back to 1 Kings, excuse me, 2 Kings 1, uh, but they changed it to Beelzebul. Um, verse 26, so you must never be afraid of them. There's that present, it's an aorist imperative with a May article. Stop being afraid. Never be afraid, okay? Uh, there is nothing covered that will not be uncovered, nor secret that will not be known. Now, you need to see Luke 12, 2 and following. What this is saying is uh, that we need to proclaim the truths of the gospel as loud as we can. It also is saying that we're going to one day give an account. Even the Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We're all going to give an account, not of sins for the Christians, but of the way we've allowed the Holy Spirit to use us, our spiritual gift, our availability, that kind of thing. There are no secrets in Christianity. It's all up and above board, and we certainly need to hear that. Uh, now, look where it mentions here. By the way, the housetops were places of social gathering, okay? Uh, verse 28, you must never be afraid. President imperative of the May article, stop being afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather you must keep on fearing him who can destroy both soul, soul and body in Gehenna. Now, I do not agree with the Greek idea that we are both body and soul. I mean, body separate and soul. There's two different dichotomy there. I believe in the Hebrew idea from Genesis 2-7 uh, that God formed us out of the Tigris, Euphrates, River Valley's clay and breathed into us the breath of life. We became a living nephesh. Now, to me, we are a unity. I realize there are some verses that speak of body, soul, and spirit, but they are primary aspects of the unity. We are a unity. The only place we're going to be separated from body is in the, in the disembodied state between death and the resurrection, which is an abnormal state. Uh, so I, I, I've done a tape on that called Unity Dichotomy or Trichotomy, and I hope you'll send for our catalog of over 1,500 teaching tapes. Now, this word about the pit, this is the word Gehenna, comes from two words, Ge, valley, and Hinnom, the valley of the sons of Hinnom, where the god Molech was worshipped in child, child sacrifice. Now, these gods, this god was a Phoenician god, and the children were offered to it to ensure fertility. The Jews hated this. They made this area a garbage dump, and Jesus used this burning garbage dump for a, as a symbol or metaphor for eternal separation to those who do not trust him. Jesus is the one who talks about hell more than anyone else. The only use of the real term Gehenna or hell outside the words of Jesus in the book of James where he says our tongue is set on fire by the fires of hell. Now, notice verse 29 and 30. What great verses of encouragement. Are not spare us uh, sold or sell for a cent? 
This means this is a word that means one sixteenth of a denarii. Now, denarii was a day's wage. So divide your daily wage by sixteenth, and uh, sixteen you'll get the idea of what two sparrows cost. And yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's notice. Even the very heads of, hairs of your head have been counted by God, so stop being afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. Another President Perry with the May article. They were afraid. They were intimidated by going out into the world to speak his name. He said, I'm going to be with you guys. Sparrows don't fall without God knowing it. God's got the hairs of your head numbered. Even though they're going to be hostile against you and mad and beat you and accuse you of not being godly, hey, I'm with you. I won't let you down. I'm right there. I've got the very hairs of your head numbered. That ought to encourage us who try to do the will of God amidst such persecution and rejection. And friends, if you're really living for God in a world like ours, you're going to experience rejection, persecution, misunderstanding. I promise you. Most of us are going with the flow of culture. That's why we don't uh, ever have any persecution, hardly. We will, if we live for Him, suffer that persecution. Now, Notice what it mentioned in verse 32. Therefore, everyone who will own me before men, I will own before my Father in heaven. But anyone who disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is obvious in the context of these trials and public persecution that's going to come. The word own is the word homologeo, which means to say the same thing as. It means to publicly affirm our relation and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, the disown, this can be done. Well, you might want to see for that uh, only before men, Mark 8, 38 for the parallel. Whoever's ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of them. Now, the disown can be done in word or actions or simply in activity. Now, my particular denomination has institutionalized this uh, homologeo in a public invitation at the end of the service. We can, sh we can by the way we live, any place in our life, uh, let people know that we belong to Jesus, that we're trusting Him and Him alone for our salvation. And that's what he's talking about, this, this personal relationship that issues in a lifestyle, a day-by-day, -day, a living and speaking and doing in such a way they'll give glory to our Father who's in heaven. Now, the latter part of this chapter deals with what seems so difficult. Do you suppose that I've come to bring peace? Yes, everybody expects that, that knowing Christ ought to bring peace, it ought to bring success, it ought to bring happiness, it ought to bring abundance. And yet, just the opposite is normally the case. Uh, when he says here, by the way, I have uh, come to bring peace, you might want to see Luke 12, 49 through 53, and compare that, what seems to be contradictory, to John 3, 17. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, and yet by his very coming, he did judge the world. Well, he, he's come twice. He's going to come twice. The first time he came uh, to bring men to God. And yet, by the very fact that he's coming, men have just uh, uh, diametrically spit over, uh, over his person and work, who he is and what he's done. And I want to tell you, he's coming again as the King of King and Lord of Lords. He came the first time as the Savior on the colt, on, on Calvary. He's coming again on the white charger. And friends, wait till you see him next time. Now, uh, I have come to bring peace but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be members of his own family. Think about Peter's rejection of Christ. Uh, this seems to be a quote up here from Micah 7, 6. You ought to follow up with that. Verse uh, 37, anybody who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. See Luke 9, 62. Now this idea of love more than me, is, this is a Hebrew idiom of comparison, which in Luke 12, excuse me, Luke 14, 26 means hate father and mother. And you need to go back to Genesis 29, 31 and 33, Deuteronomy 21, 15, Malachi 1, 2 and 3, quoted in Romans 9, 13, and John 12, 25, to see this Hebrew idiom of comparison. This is the radical call of fellowship that says, I'm going to trust Christ, I'm going to live for Him, I'm going to serve Him no matter what. It's that little song, though none go with me, I still will follow. Friends, that's true. Of the most intimate relationships of life, Jesus must be priority. And then he comes to this idea about nobody is worthy of me who does not take up his cross and follow me. The cross was not a little emblem you wear around your neck or on your Bible. It was a it was an emblem of a horrible death. They knew about this death. It was a it was a Phoenician deal that the Romans 
made even worse. But they were familiar with it from Antiochus Epiphanes, from Alexander Janaeus, from the Roman general Varus. All of these had crucified many Jews. They knew what it meant, what Jesus was saying. Christianity is so, no nice little uh, come to church once a week, God's going to bless you thing. It's a laying down of your life, a once and for all surrender of all that you are in any circumstances all the rest of your days for him. It is a radical call and how we have culturized that into milk toast. Now I'll tell you this. Everybody who gains his lower life will lose his higher life. And anybody who loses his higher life, for my sake, will gain his higher life. Now, here's a play on the Greek word suke. Higher and lower are a translation attempt to solve that. It simply means that if we live for ourselves, if we focus all that we have on me and mine, we're going to miss we're going to miss the kingdom of God. For knowing Jesus is a knowledgeable, knowing, laying down of self and picking up his life, his cause, his words, his truth, his will for our lives. It's Galatians 2.20. You might want to see this paradox throughout the, the Gospels. Matthew 16.25, Mark 8.35, Luke 9.24, Luke 17, excuse me, Luke 9.24, Luke 17.33, John 12.25. It's a play on the word. If we live for ourselves in this age, we're going to miss the Messiah in the next. But if we live for him in this age, the next age is going to be eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But we must lay down our lives now to show him. I want to tell you the gospel is absolutely free, but the gospel costs everything that you are and have. It's the paradox of a free gift that takes everything. And it's, 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 I know it's difficult. This idea about whosoever welcomes me, it's a personal relationship, not a theology or a ritual or a church. Whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. And whoever welcomes a prophet uh, as a prophet receives the reward of a prophet. Whoever welcomes an upright man will receive the reward of an upright man. Well, some think this is the idea. You might well see Matthew 25, 31 and following where people help others in Jesus' name. They're really helping Jesus. Our love for others is an expression of our love for Jesus. The word prophet and upright man seem to be maybe titles for Jesus. The prophet from Deuteronomy 18, 15 and 18 and the upright man from Acts 7, 52 and the use of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So here we have the idea of when we receive the least human being in Jesus' name in reality, we're loving Jesus by our acts for that person. I hope you'll evaluate your life based on the radical call of discipleship from Jesus. We need to count the cost of what it means to follow him. We can't follow him in our own strength. We need his strength. But we need to follow him in love for others. I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again same time, same place next week.